Warm welcome back to Race Day Live. We're underway at Turf Fontaine. Next race due off there 11 o'clock and the full race cards, of course, are on at theraces.com. Uh, now, a uh, special guest today. We've heard from lots of key players, haven't we, in the racing industry over the last few days. Here's another of them. Paul Struthers is the boss of the PJA, the Professional Jockeys Association, who I'm sure um, has his members under a, a, a whole lot of pressure at the moment. And because of that, Paul, we thank you very much indeed for your time. Good morning, Paul. Morning, John. Yeah, um, grim times, Paul. It'd be nice if we could inject a little bit of positivity. I don't know where that's going to come from, but just um, is, is the situation with your members as bleak as we're guessing it is at the moment, Paul? I think the situation for, for, for jockeys is bleak in the same way it's bleak for uh, racing and in the same way it's bleak and it's worrying for the rest of the country and the entire world. And I don't think um, we can get away from that at all. Obviously, the whole of racing is significantly affected by this, and, and jockeys are no different. Obviously, jockeys are certainly in the very short term, potentially the most immediately affected given that they are largely, not quite exclusively, because we have apprentices and conditional jockeys who are employed by trainers, they are largely self-employed and their ability to earn any income um, outside of maybe some continuation of race of, of riding out income is immediately curtailed. But that's obviously my responsibility and our responsibility at the PJA is for, for, for our members but it is important to acknowledge that it is not just jockeys that are affected. And I'm not just saying, oh, it's dreadful for jockeys. It is, but not just jockeys. It is the whole sport. It is trainers. It is breeders. It is racing staff. It is um, owners. It is uh, administrators. It is race course staff. It is broadcasters. This, this crisis affects absolutely everyone. Mm. Paul, have any of your members been on to you and, and, and just wanting to talk through this whole difference between um, the BHA's uh, stance on racing behind closed doors and islands? It must be difficult for jockeys here in England watching meetings taking place in, over across the Irish Sea. That must, be, that must be a source of some frustration, I would have thought. I haven't had any specific conversations with jockeys about that point, but would have zero doubt that those questions are there. Um, now, we have tried to keep our members as up to speed as we've been able to in a very fast-moving situation. Obviously, it was announced Monday that we were going behind closed doors with stringent hygiene measures. Um, then the Prime Minister had his press briefing at five o'clock that evening. The, anyone really kind of paying attention to that, it posed questions, and our, many of our members were cognizant of that. There was, there'd been an industry-wide COVID-19 group meeting regularly for many weeks already, and almost two separate groups, a, a kind of medical-specific one and then a, a, then a wider group. So I know there were significant conference calls on the Monday evening and again into Tuesday morning, and I was part of the one that happened on Tuesday. So we have tried to explain. We sent out a briefing to our members on Tuesday evening, um, trying to explain to them how difficult the decision had been. And, of course, it had been hugely difficult because um, no one was unaware of the consequences it would have in the short to medium term, both for people individually and potentially long-term consequences for the sport as well. Um, and obviously, with, with racing in Ireland carrying on behind closed doors, that question will be posed. But there, may, there are significant differences. Obviously, Ireland have taken, as a country, more aggressive containment steps than we perhaps took as a country. They are therefore behind us on the kind of timescale that we're facing in Britain. But it might just be worth kind of explaining a, a, a bit of that rationale behind the decision to take, because it was a very difficult decision. I have to say it was one the PJA supported. Uh, 
supported with huge understandable reluctance uh, but did but it was first and foremost based on medical expert medical evidence and particularly around the imminent withdrawal of um, medical services, the call and demands on the NHS, the risks that medics were concerned this would place on the health and safety and welfare of jockeys. You know, it, it's far from uncommon that jockeys get injured during the course of racing and are transported to hospital uh, via ambulance. And whilst that ambulance provision on race courses is mainly private, you still got to get to a &E and be treated. And there was huge concern that that would be impacted and we were putting those jockeys in harm's way. Um, there was any additional risk of infection with jockeys and their valets, et cetera, being in confined areas. Um, the 200 or so racecourse medical staff were surveyed and their views were, 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 were sought. Um, indirect evidence from senior figures with knowledge of the pressures of the NHS. And, and I think we, we should not be in any doubt. And we've seen the subsequent um, announcements from government on restrictions and on uh, support that will be made available to the whole country. And those announcements will keep coming and the restrictions will keep coming. But even if we'd have carried on behind closed doors, and, and I think we practically we could have carried on behind closed doors for... I don't know, five days, six days, maybe a week. But it was going to get stopped. It, we were not going to be able to continue for any longer than that. And this wasn't the reason for the decision. The decision was entirely medically based and particularly around protecting the NHS, protecting the wider public and protecting our jockeys. But if racing would have continued behind closed doors in the circumstances we face in this country, circumstances that we were advised we were tracking no more than two weeks behind where Italy currently was, and Italy's in a whole country lockdown. The reputational damage on racing, um, long-term reputational damage, we might never have come back from. That was a completely separate and additional consideration that did not inform and force the decision, but it was an important consideration all the same. Uh, Paul, uh, Simon Mapletoft here. Hi, Simon. Hi there, Paul. Uh, uh, of course, we, uh, you know, we hear that um, in, in, in ordinary circumstances just how difficult it can be for the, you know, the, the jockeys towards the bottom end of the, the, the food chain to carve out a living and, and um, you know, travelling up and down the country, the associated costs they have with that, getting a minimal amount of rides. Um, uh, w what kind of measures have you got in place to, to, to give those guys support? Because they're going to be feeling the pinch, of course, much more so than the, the more established riders at this moment. Yeah, I, I think many jockeys will be feeling the pinch almost immediately. Um, I think it would be easy, potentially, to think of jockeys, there will be, look, let's be, let's be clear, there will be a very, very, very small number of jockeys who are financially isolated from any concerns that this suspension of racing creates, whether that's for six weeks or whether it's for longer. But they will immediately be feeling the pinch. Now, again, it was a, a, another reason, another benefit to suspending racing, well, the, the only one in many ways, um, was that, the sport could then focus on financially mitigating this suspension for the whole of the sport. Jockeys being, from my personal perspective, albeit I clearly see the much bigger picture, a big part of that. Now, that work has started. That work will go on with great urgency. Um, so packages of support will be made available in addition to those packages of support that the government will make available to small businesses and to individuals. I can't say, Simon, what those packages look like yet, but what I can say, and I can say with certainty, and talking specifically to my members, but I know it will apply to the rest of the support, uh, the rest of the sport, is that support will be there. Support already is there, so jockeys facing immediate, and I mean immediate, financial difficulty 
the support's already there through the IJF and through, through the Injured Jockeys Fund, who already provide that support. And if they are in immediate financial difficulty, they can get in touch with us and get in, in touch with the IJF, and we will support them immediately. But we are looking at a longer-term um, package of support. As I say, the PJA has a six-figure sum of money that we will be putting into that package of support. Other funding avenues within the sport are being spoken to at the moment. Um, I stress this isn't just support for jockeys, but I'm just talking specifically about jockeys. There will be support for everyone because we know, you know, there's, there's this industry piece of work going on at the moment, looking at the economics of the sport as a whole in order to inform our future plans around the fixing list, et cetera. And this was independent work. This isn't just the PJA tent say these are the numbers. The medium flat jockey, after all their fixed expenses, would earn less than 30000 which is a salary for the general public that they'll go, well, that's not too bad. And I would agree it's not too bad, but it is probably a salary for a 60-plus hour week. Um, the medium jump jockey would be less than 20000 You know, so... This, this, this will be of significant impact to jockey. It is their primary, primary worry at the moment, along with the same concerns we all have for family, friends, loved ones, and for society as a whole. Um, so I can't give detail now other than that immediate, immediate pressure that can be relieved by the IJF, hopefully. But there will be packages announced in the coming days and work's going on urgently on those. And, Paul, I think, you know, at a time when we're all desperate for a shaft of light, a crumb of comfort, I, I, would, I would hope your members listening to you there would at least feel that, I don't know, we're, we're less isolated. Just hearing you say that the wheels are in motion for support is, must be gratefully received, I'm sure. And we know, I mean, we, 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 we informed our members of that on, on Tuesday evening when we sent them our briefing note. And it is, it is really hard to be positive at this stage. And, and I, people who know me know I'm probably not the most positive person naturally myself. But um, I think this is something that's, that's being suffered by the whole world. Our focus is on racing and making sure that when this ends, racing is a position to resume quickly and safely, and that racing is in a position to be strengthened for the future. Now, I don't, you don't just want to give platitudes, John, and I don't think they're helpful. In fact, they're not. But I genuinely mean this and believe this. The world has changed, and, 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 and it has. Our world within racing, our world within Britain and the United Kingdom, within Europe, within within the whole world. It has changed, and it will have changed forever. How? I don't know. Um, what that looks like, I don't know. But I live in a little village, and I think what what this will do, and this is one, and, and it's the thing that racing has always been brilliant at in terms of looking after its own and the racing community. But this will... In time, when we get through it, I genuinely, genuinely believe this will make us think more about the small things, the important things, about family, about friends, about community. Um, we, it will change the way those of us like me and people who work at the BHA and elsewhere work in offices. You know, we're already learning that why have we ever travelled to London for meetings um, when we can do it through these amazing online conference facilities? Um will become, hopefully, whether it lasts, this could be incredibly naive. We talk within racing about the impacts of social media and the negative impacts of social media. And it's why I came off 18 months ago. I just can't stand people speaking to each other in a way on social media. They would most, 99% of them, would never dream of speaking to someone face-to-face. -face. And you can only hope that things like that change and be, we become nicer, we become kinder. And I genuinely believe all those things that will happen but I think that all of those things are also racing strengths. Racing is an incredibly difficult sport, particularly for jockeys and everyone else. But racing is great at those things that I think are going to get better when we get through this anyway. So I think there is a tiny, tiny glimmer of light about this. Um, I think racing can come through it in a stronger position for its long-term long sustainability. Might that mean racing looks different? 
it might. Um, but it's not hopeless. And our efforts and the efforts of the whole sport, I know, are focused on um, putting in place the support that's needed immediately and planning for racing's imminent return, hopefully, to society's return to normal and placing racing and all of its people in the best possible position. Absolutely fascinating to hear you uh, speak, Paul, um, and, and thanks again for all your time this morning. Just before you go, though, can we, can we just ask about, um, <coughs> excuse me, about um, day-to-day -day mental welfare um, from here on in? Is there anything at all you can do to help your members just get up in the morning, just put one foot in front of the other? We do an awful lot of work in the, in the area of mental well-being anyway, and we were already supporting lots of jockeys with their mental well-being before all this happened. You know, we, we've talked many times about how difficult the life of a jockey is over and above all the other pressures and stresses that life brings you. They're over and above the financial support work, which is jockeys' pressing concern, there is other work commencing um, from a from a well-being perspective. So working with Jerry, led by Jerry Hill at the BHA, but working with um, the Injured Jockeys Fund and their rehab centres and their strength and conditioning and fitness experts, working with the nutritionists, working with our existing mental health and well-being providers, whether that's Sporting Chance, whether that's Cognacity, whether that's Aidan Conlon, who's our own kind of in-house performance consultant, um, to assist jockeys throughout this period um, with their physical health, their mental well-being, and to put them in the best possible position to remain an athlete so that when racing returns, they are ready to go. It's, it, there's a lot of work. With the, it doesn't change the existing support. So jockeys who are struggling with this, as, as, as many people will be, the support is there and, and, and jockeys are aware of that support to the point that, you know, in the last four years, well over 100 jockeys now have accessed our mental well-being support options. Um, but that wider package of, of, of wellness and athlete type support is, is, is being worked on as well. Mm. And you talked, Paul, at, at depth, at, in depth and eloquently about how, how you how you see that the the whole face of racing could change as and when we come out of this. Um, and in terms of uh, pure economics, I mean, I, I'm absolutely no expert on that, but I wonder whether or not going forward, and, and I'm talking a year, two years' time, maybe, we will all have to take some responsibility financially. To, to try and make sure that in the eventuality of something like this happening again in the future, God forbid, we're in a better place. Now, I don't know, I don't know whether that's a penny tax on all of our bets, et cetera, et cetera, but there has to be some formula, doesn't there, to improve the financial situation going forward, Paul? I, I, I think we're lucky insofar as you have organisations already, and not, such as the levy board and the Racing Foundation, who have chunky reserves, but reserves that would go pretty quickly, but they're in, they're in stable financial positions, albeit clearly they, they themselves are not receiving any income as a result of this crisis as well. It, it, it's those types of considerations, and, and when you start thinking about them, when you ever have a spare minute, and we've got lots of other things that are probably more important to us personally that we need to be worried about at the moment, but when you think about those aspects and, and, and across the whole sport, it's why that when you see through this just long, worrying period of uncertainty that we're all going through, you can see things where you go oh, immediately. You can recognise where we can start doing things differently, however that means, where there may be more understanding of the pressures that are on each different aspect of the industry. But it is impossible to say at the moment how that might, that might look. But it's why I think that as, as, as much as this short-term difficulty and by short term i'm meaning six weeks or whether it's 12 weeks or whatever it is john this short-term difficulty will have long-term consequences um in terms of you know you've got bloodstock sales being cancelled you know what will happen to owners whose businesses are under pressure etc etc so you just 
can't foresee where that will go. But I think whenever there's a crisis, crises create opportunities. You don't want the crisis because you, you want to create opportunities without there being a crisis in the first place, if that makes sense. You're not, you're not wanting a crisis. But when they are there, there are opportunities that automatically are created from that. So let's take jockeys specifically. Jockeys never have an off-season. And this isn't an off-season. It would be perverse to call it an off-season. But unlike other sports, jockeys don't get a break. There's a, it's just a grind. It's 363 days a year. They don't get time. There is, over the next six weeks, going to be that opportunity, touching on what you asked me earlier around well-being and fitness and everything, that they will at least be able to have that kind of process that other professional athletes and sportsmen have. So that's a short-term opportunity. I know it's one that jockeys listen to this will go, Paul, I don't give a stuff about that at the moment. I'm just worried how I'm paying my mortgage next month, the same as many people will be. And I get that. But it's an opportunity all the same. And this will... This will present other opportunities for racing at the same time as being completely cognizant of the fact it's going to create other more medium term difficulties that we'll have to work together to address. Paul Struthers, Chief Executive of the Professional Jockeys Association. Uh, really good, albeit in difficult circumstances, Paul, to spend some time with you. Love listening to you and very best of luck to all of you and your team and your work going forward. And of course, all the best to all your members. And likewise to you and everyone else at Sky and all your, all your families. John, be safe. Thank you, Paul. Good luck, Paul. Thanks, Paul Struthers. Simon. Take care. Paul Struthers from the PJA. Real food for thought there, Simon. It's just quite good. I think it's quite helpful in a tiny, small way just to chat through all those things, you Isn't know, it? as well, don't yeah. you think? Eloquently, passionately mm. put forward. And, um, you know, I think any, any jockey's watching this morning and, and 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 I know they've had communication mm -hmm. uh, but hearing Paul speak so passionately um, about their welfare financial welfare mental welfare whatever ever you want to call it I think they'll take great comfort from that and how refreshing and reassuring to hear Paul say that a six-figure sum has already been designated uh, to help